partnership with parents in the community through Birmingham Public Schools will provide educational excellence that empowers students to cultivate their individual brilliance and positively impact the world. Welcome. Tonight is Tuesday, April 16th, and this is the Birmingham Board of Education meeting. The first order of business is roll call. Tracy? Trustee Azulu. Ted Sachtel. <laughs> Present. Trustee Holtinger. Here. Trustee Joseph. Here. All students in Birmingham will realize their full potential, think critically, and champion an innovator tomorrow. Then we had board norms that we um, agreed upon together, and our board norms are to be respectful and reflective, to come to board meetings prepared, no surprises, to ask questions and seek to understand opinions assume positive intent, and understand and respect the role of a trustee. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Robertson for recognitions. Good evening, board trustees. Good evening. Uh, we have uh, our first recognition I'm going to ask Principal Wicker from Seahome High School to come up because we want to recognize our student, the student representatives on the City of Birmingham Board of Commission. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Every year, Seahome students partner with the City of Birmingham, sitting on a variety of school boards. From learning about city planning to helping create a public policy to working designing the future of Birmingham's green spaces, these students have given dozens of hours to better their community. Tonight, we recognize seven seniors who were board members for the city of Birmingham. Five could not be here tonight. They are Andrew McLean, Luca DeSanto, Ian Weinberg, Kate Glazer, and Asher Kafta. But I would like to recognize these two special gentlemen who were able to make it tonight. First, uh, Alexander Matea, we asked him why he wanted this opportunity. He told me his motivations came from his interest in studying history, economics, and the social interactions in order to broaden his personal knowledge. From the experience, he learned how to formal meetings occur, as well as the topics being discussed at such meetings. In addition, he is taking away knowledge about his city's history, as well as how to make the right decisions with presented with issues. Please congratulate Alex on his hard work. Our second honoree tonight is Matthew Wigan. When asked what he motivated him to join the planning board for the city of Birmingham, he told me he wanted to join because he has an interest in real estate. He also wanted to meet the people who did business in his city so he could learn new information. From the experience, he learned many things, including how different business, businesses compose themselves. He also was able to use the information he learned to get into the Honors Business Program at Oakland University. Please congratulate Matthew on his hard work. <laughs> Thank you to Alex and Matt and all the other students involved. We look forward to more students taking part in the civic process next year. Let me get some pictures with the superintendent. If parents are present, Please come up to the front and take your pictures. This is a wonderful moment. Good to capture.
Our next recognition is our Reflections Awards, which is part of our Parent Teacher Association, um, part of their, their uh, realm. If I can have Diana Patterson come up. Diana Patterson um, is over Reflections, and she has been um, our Reflections Chair for quite a long time. And this is her, her last year, because she has a graduating senior. So in addition to recognizing the students, if we can recognize Diana Patterson as well. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to introduce this year's 13 BPS State Reflections finalists. Uh, Reflections is a national PTA art program that's been around for over 50 years. Uh, it was created to support the arts and, uh, the arts and education uh, initiative by providing an opportunity for students to participate in the arts and also acknowledging those students uh, for their achievements. <clears throat> Each year, hundreds of thousands of students from across the country in grades pre-K through 12 participate by creating art in response to a student-selected theme. This year's theme was, I am hopeful because. Students participate by creating art in one of, of or any of the six art categories. Uh, then they submit their artwork to their local school PTA in one of the five grade divisions, uh, including an all grade division for students that need accommodations. Our, uh, at our state level, the Michigan PTA Reflections Program recognizes the top four submissions in each art category and grade division. The top honor is the award for outstanding interpretation. BPS had four students uh, whose artwork received this award, and their entries have been forwarded to the national program. Uh, the results of uh, that contest will be announced in May. So starting with the students who uh, are receiving the award for interpretation, our outstanding interpretation, uh, if you could please come up when I call your name and uh, stay up here until all the names have been announced and we'll take a picture. So, um, receiving the award for outstanding interpretation um, from C. Home High School, Annalise Toma for high school dance choreography. <laughs> from Pierce Elementary, uh, Esther Weisberg for intermediate dance choreography. From Beverly Elementary, Vivian Tomich uh, for Intermediate Literature. <laughs> From Groves High School, Thalia Hunter, uh, Special Artist in Dance Choreography. <laughs> uh, receiving the Award of Excellence uh, from Harlan, Cedric DeConing for primary dance choreography. From BCS, Rashane Penzak, middle school film production. From Pierce Elementary, Lev Munchnik Lee for intermediate pre, um, film production. Uh, he couldn't be here today. Uh, Lev Munchnik Lee. Uh, and from C. Home High School, Ian Patterson for high school literature. <laughs> also from C. Home High School, Owen Dobrowitzki for high school music composition. <laughs> from Groves High School, Ben Zahner, Spe Special Artist, Visual Arts. <laughs> Receiving the Award of Merit, Alina DeConing, 
Harlan Intermediate Dance Choreography. Uh, receiving honorable mention, Ava Jacobs Pierce Intermediate Music Composition. Uh, and Vivian Fioriti, Fiorito, sorry, Harlan Primary Photography. Okay. <laughs> I thought I forgot someone. Um, okay. We got everybody? I think we got everybody. Right. Thank you. Well, A beautiful, impressive group. Congratulations. <laughs> Diana, thank you so much for your service to, to this program. And that concludes our record recognitions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we have a five-minute recess if people would like to leave or leave. Thank you all for attending. Welcome to stay. What an impressive group of young Birmingham kids.
breakthrough. Uh, this last week, um, shared some ideas about how we can get into our strategic plan, especially as it relates to extracurricular activities, and she was discussing leadership among other things. And so, um, I just want to encourage the community to take advantage of those coffee and conversations when you can. I also, this it's been busy the last couple of weeks. This Saturday, um, the excitement was electric in West Maple as uh, we had 400 students participate in Science Olympiad. It was uh, a great time. Uh, we had lots of competition and actually Greenfield Elementary um, for the first time since I know I've been in this district won Science Olympiad. So, um, to the coffee and conversation that we have with the community, this is the time that we make sure we um, connect with staff. And so over the last week and a half, had the opportunity to visit the adult transition program and also Midvale uh, and participate uh, in that too with the soup. While at Midvale, they last <coughs> week were um, celebrating the Week of the Young Child, which is an annual event Association for the Education of Young Children, and it is just a time to really um, celebrate early childhood and the, and the young youngins, and also uh, really support our early childhood educators and thank them. So mm -hmm. we didn't get a chance to thank them um, last week. Um, I'm sure tomorrow is just as good. <laughs> We also did a last week did a walk board at Pierce Elementary, uh, Trustee Azarine joined me, uh, and we're, we are going to continue to do more walkthroughs at the school to the book board trustees. Um, wanted to just also give um, kudos to Greenfield Elementary and Beverly Elementary, because one of the things that um, Trustee Holcomer and Trustee Janet and I um, learned about or heard more about was uh, the OSTC program. So that's the Oakland Schools Technical Center. And you know, at a previous, I think it was a uh, school board association meeting, a joint school board association meeting, they talked about how it's really important for us as school districts, all 20 Oakland County School Districts, to take advantage of what's happening in the OSTC. And we have been ramping up our efforts um, in terms of educating the community about what the technical centers have to offer. But Beverly Elementary and Greenfield Elementary are actually taking their third graders over to the really? OSTC Boys and Girls Campus as part of their career development day. And so um, I just want to give a shout out to them. Um, there's two more things. So one, I would like to go to the podium because we do mm -hmm. have a hiring update. And I would like to Board trustees, on your consent agenda, you will see uh, the hiring of our new special education director, Audra Hold Holdorf. And if I can have Audra come up to the podium, and I know her family is here. Um, if you come on up, come on up. <laughs> um, as you know, and, and um, we will give our flowers to Mrs. Mahler at another time. But as you know, um, after many years, Mrs. Mahler is going to be uh, retiring from Birmingham Public School District. And so um, in, you know, in that vein, we wanted to make sure that we um, could hire someone for this very, very special and important essential position, but also hire them in enough time where they could be able to um, have some, some face time with, with Mrs. Mahler um, and be able to help with that transition. And so we have with us Audra Hodorf, who is the current assistant director in Ann Arbor for special education, but she has a, a plethora of uh, knowledge uh, in the special education space. 
uh, as a teacher and administrator. And I'm going to turn it over to her to just say a few words um, to our community. Thank you. Oh, you're going to help me? This is my son, Caius. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much for this opportunity. As a first generation American and a granddaughter of a teacher who taught during um, the Soviet occupation, I am thrilled and honored to take on the role of leading the Special Services Department in Birmingham Public Schools. It's with great enthusiasm that I join a community focused on students first by fostering inclusion, ensuring access, and pursuing excellence. I'm very eager to collaborate with all the stakeholders, get into the buildings, meet the teachers and staff and students to further advance the district's commitment to provide every single student with the support and resources they need to thrive, pre-K to post young adult. One last thing, I'm very grateful for my family, my husband, Eric, over there. He's not going to come up here. Um, my, um, teenage son almost, Alex, and my youngest son, Caius, and my mom, who is watching at home, who are my biggest cheerleaders. So I am very excited and looking forward to uh, arriving here in Birmingham Public Schools and wor uh, working with the exiting director to ensure a smooth transition and do the best for kids. Thank you. <laughs> We are very excited to, to have her here. We, um, for our process, we did have um, staff members, which included uh, teachers, ancillary staff from the special education department, special education supervisors, administrators, parents, um, and students on um, students from the student ambassador program on these committees. Um, Audra went through three rounds, um, and I, you know, she. Uh, rolls to the top and so we are very excited to have her here in Birmingham. So Congratulations. Yes, yes. And last for my report, um, I, we finally have uh, our, some key calendar dates. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Dean Neforos to share those key calendar dates. We have finalized the key dates. It's a little bit different next year um, than we've had traditionally, and I'll highlight that. Um, we will be starting after Labor Day. Um, we have, as you know, the last several years we've started before Labor Day, and that was primarily because um, we had a later Labor Day date for several years. Um, so as the dates are shifting back a little bit, we will be starting um, after Labor Day on September 3rd for students. So teachers first report on August 27th, the week prior, for two days of PD. Um, one of the uh, changes that will be different this year, um, election day, since this is a federal election, we will be closed entirely that day. There will be no PD or any students or staff in the buildings on the 5th. One of the things we need to do, um, because the holidays uh, during winter break fall on Wednesdays each of the weeks, um, it would be kind of awkward to have a, a 10 day break. So we, in order to get the two week break at that time, which is the common calendar, we do have to uh, have a half day of school on the Wednesday prior to Thanksgiving, which is a change from what we've done for many years. Mm -hmm. This will be a one year occurrence only. And then we will just be one day later in June, uh, which will be only on the 13th instead of the 12th. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Thanksgiving break, it will be the half day on the Wednesday and then still the Thursday and Friday. Winter break will be from December 23rd through January 3rd. Um, we will still have midwinter break uh, according to the common calendar, February 17th through the 21st. Spring break will be March 24th through the 28th next year. And then again, the last day of school will be June 13th through 25th. So those are the key dates. Um, there's just some dates we still have to work out with the DEA still about PD, conferences, and all the variety of unique aid challenging out the unified arts dates um, on our 82-week calendar. 
Um, so just some of that little fine detail work has to get done and then we'll publish the full calendar book to the community. And then are you gonna make sure that the public our community can look at our website and see it? Yeah, we're working on that right now. We'll put something out to um, Mr. Strickland when he sends something out um, and Great. everybody will get updates about the full calendar. So hopefully we can get that wrapped up in a few weeks here and get that out later this month or in May. So uh, everybody will have a full advance notice, but we know certainly people need plans in advance about the key dates and the key holidays. So we wanna make sure that is, is out there. some board comments. Um, this year, March, um, this spring, um, end of March and, and April, three major world religions celebrated a major holiday. And so to all of those who celebrated Easter, I wish you a very happy Easter season. To all of you who celebrated Ramadan and Eid, I wish you Ramadan Kareem. And upcoming now is the Passover season. So to all of our community members who are about to embark on Passover, I wish you a happy and peaceful Passover season. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I have the monthly report for the Government Relations Committee. We had a special guest that spoke regarding the tobacco problem uh, in the community and the high school, and especially with and related to the African American community and how it affects them, um, and how there will be hopefully a legislation. Like I don't know how many people know that, but anything that vaping doesn't have sales tax. I never knew that. So hopefully that will be passed in the legislature so we can get some more tax revenue from the state. Uh, and then hopefully we'll also uh, distract people from um, buying them. So just to get you, to let you know, uh, unfortunately there isn't really great news about the tobacco use in Michigan. Actually, what's interesting, uh, the speaker links Michigan to 12 other states, <clears throat> and those 13 states are the fifth largest use of tobacco in the world. Um, so um, there's, for example, there is 57% failure rate in Detroit suburb, um, in Grand Rapids, 33% failure rate, Lansing 20, and then this is when people, you know, people uh, don't ID, they, they go to the tobacco shop, they don't get ID, and then also there was also talk that when you're looking at tobacco usage, really you don't have a license, like a liquor license, where you have to apply and get background checks and all of that, so there's also possibly talk about having a required tobacco license, so that way uh, people would be retailers would be forced to uh, have an actual license to sell tobacco. So Trustee Joseph, does that apply to all of those vape stores you see popping up everywhere? Yeah. I mean, honestly, what surprises me the most is there is no sales tax on this. That's shocking. And no, and no permits. Yeah, no permits. <coughs> exactly. Um, so the other part, the other portion of the uh, the other portion of the meeting was about the state legislator, and because honestly this was such a hot button conversation, the meeting was kind of short. <laughs> but it is a hot button, and I kind of really s summarized the, the as little as possible into from this presentation, so I don't want to take too much time. But um, uh, and of course the. Uh, just one other thing as I was saying, so this is the retailers that were selling to kids, like I mentioned in Detroit is 57%, that's amazing. These are un, these are underage kids who are getting access to tobacco. Um, so there's few legislature, legislation in front of the 
state. There's dyslexia screening and intervention, the FASVA graduation requirement, the school safety and threat assessment, the prohibit unfunded mandates as well as the mandatory kindergarten, as well as we're going, uh, trying to tackle the, the budget, the school aid budget. And Governor Whitmer already signed the care adoption services that improve the quality education for children in the foster homes and adoptive services as well. And um, the State Board of Education approached certain sections of the governor's proposed budget and urged that they just later to allocate funding related to the public education literacy. And that's pretty much it. Uh, it was really, I enjoyed going to these meetings. It's really a lot to learn, so if anyone wants to attend these meetings, they're always held the first Wednesday of the month. The next meeting is May 1st. to congratulate Treasurer Hokemer on completing her level four MASB classes. That's a huge accomplishment, so thank you for your service to our board and your commitments. Um, Birmingham Youth in Service Awards are Wednesday, April 24th at the Grove Kiddo Theater. Um, from our board meeting last week, the chair, Ann Manning, mentioned that we have 31 high schoolers receiving honors and nine middle schoolers. Um, so that's April 24th at the Grove Kiddo Theater. Uh, Touch a Truck is the first Saturday in May, and that will be at Bingham Farms. And then I, too, um, had an opportunity to visit Science Olympiad on Saturday and watch ping pong, propulsion, and then the <laughs> bottle rockets outside. So it's my favorite event. To, it's a great opportunity to have all eight elementary schools and DPS in one place. So um, that was Beverly, they invited all of us as trustees to come and read, and I know at least four of us were there. Yeah, oh, you did? Oh, no, yeah. I did it last year. I wasn't there this year. Um, it was so much fun, although I have to say the children in the room I was in, they were so enthusiastic I barely got through the book, but <laughs> that was good too. It is a fun thing to do. It is. So thank you for inviting us. We, we like to do that, we'll come again. Yes, thank you. If nobody else has anything else, we'll move on to public comment. Um, and before we begin, I just wanna read our public comment policy. Because the Birmingham Board of Education values public meetings, not just meetings in public, we welcome public comment on school issues. Most comments can be concisely stated in three minutes, and the board respectfully asks that commenting may focus on the topic or issue and not on specific personnel. We welcome your comments but cannot s discuss nor debate items not on the agenda. When asked to discuss non-agenda items, we can share facts but not engage in discussion. We need to follow laws regarding public notice on issues and be aware that other community members may have interest in the topic but without proper notice may not be present to contribute. With that, I would like to invite Cindy Sedaseri to the podium. Good evening, I'm Cindy Sedaseri. I am an IS at um, Instructional Specialist at Beverly, and I just wanted to come and share some special things that are happening at Beverly. Um, the first one is, as part of March is Reading Month, not only did we have some of our trustees come and read, but our student, our Bobcat Student Leadership Group was part of, um, their groups were part of uh, getting together to um, work on a, a school-wide book swap and we were able to have 600 books were swapped between all of the kids, JK, all, all of our kids, JK up to fifth grade, and then 700 books were gathered to um, donate to a school in Detroit that is having a family event, and they needed some books to be a part of their family event. So 700 books will be delivered next week to their school so they can have a big family-wide event in reading as well. Um, this group has also gotten involved in lots of other student like service learning projects. So I'm just excited about the way that they have uh, really lifted up their leadership and uh, brought our school into developing some things, not only 
in the school but across the community. Um, I'm also excited to welcome a junior kindergarten into Beverly. I tell you, it fills my bucket to walk into that classroom. They are the most curious, excited, just, I mean, just wonderful learners in, um, in our school. And it's just such a great thing to have within Beverly. They happen to be our first stop on the new hire. Um, I had seven new teachers that came for some job embedded professional learning. And I said, this is the place that you're gonna learn the most about just the development of their language, their writing, just really stop, notice, wonder. Um, we had wonderful discussions about it. So it's a great, great thing to have a junior kindergarten in, in, in school. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about our, um, our student uh, like success coaches and team that's out there has come up with a new way to not only have students recognized about what they're doing, um, but also to um, think about parent communication. So they actually put together stickers that have to do with our pledge, responsibility, respect, um, honesty, kindness. Those are given to the students if we see them uh, exemplary in any type of those behaviors. And then a postcard comes home to the parent to let them know um, as well. Um, we also, we are going to OTEC um, as third grade, but we also are having a, a school-wide career day. Um, so that's another way that we're working on, on things like that. And finally, if you haven't had a chance to go over to Beverly Park, uh, our kindergartners are getting uh, ready to go to the Beverly Story um, book trail. Um, and that's a great place if you have a little one to go along and read a book, that's an amazing place to go. So thanks for your support at Beverly. Um, we're doing some really fun things over there. to invite Mr. Kekos to the podium. Good evening, board. I've been previously here a number of times in order to share the progressive updates on the community's perspective as to how curriculum is brought into the district. Uh, in the past, I've shared about the value of collaboration, transparency, uh, the value of what we describe in our brochures are the core values of our district. Things like community, community participation, uh, integrity, as well as the strategic priorities such as the culture of unity, uh, as well as responsible stewardship. So looking at the district's uh, policies around curriculum as we dove in a little deeper, uh, and this wasn't just myself, this was a group of professionals that specialize in curriculum, curriculum development, not only in the state, but across the nation. Uh, and so I provided some suggestions on what we can do as a district on improving that. One of those recommendations that I didn't do a good job in clarifying at my last session was records retention. When developing curriculum, we have work products, such as surveys, data that's collected, information as to who participates in the curriculum and so forth. And that's all part of the work product. As curriculum goes forward, as our policy in the district describes. And the value of building integrity and responsible stewardship is ensuring we adhere to our district's policy. There's a reason why the board brings forward a policy. The expectation is our administrators, teachers adhere to them. And so if those records are not being retained, the community begins to lose trust and that creates a whole host of issues. Our group recently requested some information and we were told, we don't have time to give it to you. It's not readily accessible. We're gonna ask you to file a FOIA in order to get access to that data. Now you would understand that didn't sit well with many of the community members that felt this information should have been readily available. So we're moving forward with the FOIA as well as any other agreements or documents that we need to put forward, be it legal or a nudge or we need to escalate. But again, I strongly encourage the board to spread the message that transparency only increases integrity as well as collaboration with the community. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to invite Fleur Zahner up to the podium. Hello, my name is Fleur Zahner, and I'm not just here to celebrate as a proud Reflections parent, but I'm here also to represent Beverly Elementary and share some of the great things that we're doing. 
Beverly's mascot is the bobcat, and bobcats live in dens. Each staff member has a den full of multi-age students who stay in their dens year after year. So as fifth graders move on to middle school, dens gain a junior kindergartner. We also have buddy classrooms that combine upper and lower elementary classrooms together to meet, share their learning with each other throughout the year. Bobcat dens and buddies really help build our Beverly community as they give each student chances to meet and get to know other students in the building in different grades, as well as form relationships with staff members that they may never even have as a teacher. It's through these groups that we have been able to do a lot of our better together work. We might use den or buddy time to learn about what equity means, or we might create something together to show our commitment to community and inclusion. This year, Beverly was fortunate enough to be able to bring the ASD program back to our building. One of our recent buddy activities involved creating inclusion flags, like this one, and um, each flag is unique, special, and heartfelt. We placed the flags in front of our building in conjunction with Autism Acceptance Month. So as you approach the building, you see just this huge sea of flags flying um, to represent our inclusive and welcoming community. It's really nice. We'll reuse these flags during other times in the year, such as for our upcoming diversity night. Um, please consider joining us. It's on April 30th from 6 to 7.30. We have several families as well as some BPS affinity groups that are hosting rooms to represent different cultures. The Beverly Singers are going to be singing and we'll have food trucks, so please come. Speaking of ASD students, Beverly has really made an effort to help these new students and families feel included in our events. For example, at this year's Celebrate the Arts Night, we had a silent disco, and it was a hit with everyone who participated. This year, Beverly was named a Michigan Green School for the 18th year in a row, and not many people know that Beverly Elementary was actually the first school in Oakland County to earn the Michigan Green School designation. Speaking of being green, our fourth graders were recently visited by DTE, and as a result, students are currently conducting home energy audits and recommending energy saving products that are provided by for free by DTE. In our fifth grade, um, we've created a plant propagation garden and also started a warm composting station. And finally, all of our grades are continuing to enjoy our hammock garden. Students use this workspace to read, take a break, and connect with each other. Thank you so much for your partnership in making Birmingham Public School District the best that it can be. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Eric Davidson to the podium. Hello, uh, I'm Eric Davidson, and I'll try and keep this brief. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about transparency and neutrality. Uh, from a transparency standpoint, to uh, emulate other districts, I'm uh, making a request that study sessions be live streamed and recorded just like this meeting is today. Um, I believe that is a strong step towards transparency and really uh, community awareness of some of the things that we're going to vote on tonight. Um, so that's something that I think you have the capability to do and it's something we would love to see as a community uh, for people who travel, who have other commitments. Kids have sports, kids are in three different sports. It's tough to make it to um, meetings like that. And um, also notice some topics will pop onto the agenda um, even within 24 hours of the meeting and it's tough to kind of juggle things to make it. Um, in that same vein, uh, from a neutrality standpoint, I had a class called Controversial Issues when I was in high school and this was taught by the football coach and dean of students, and um, we had a great political discourse. So it was, a, it was neutral, but it was presenting and goading the students into thinking of both sides. We had a paper due every week on a non-inflammatory issue. They didn't want to hear about the hottest issues, but um, we would pick one every week, and page one would be the history of the issue, page two would be taking the pro side, so you'd have to read a publication that took the pro side. Page three would be taking the con side on that issue, and page four would be your opinion, which you learned 
by doing your research. And then we would discuss those and current events. And the, the teacher really goaded us to think from both angles and put yourself and empathize with the other side. In doing the course review, I'm, I'm feeling like that's not uh, the case for some of the courses, uh, that I saw a very strong bias uh, in narrative, um, even seeing, and I, I don't know what passages were included from Paulo Ferreri's book, uh, but I do know who that person is and um, some of his very anti-capitalistic um, standpoints about oppression, liberation, and um, about really driving classrooms into revolution, and boy, I hope that's not in that class. Um, that's not what I hope, um, I would think that most of the parents in Birmingham would not want that type of message. Though, again, I missed the study session, so I can't go look at a recording and see what, uh, what actually is in that class that's being voted on, but it's something I'd like you to consider, um, is that transparency and, and giving parents the, in the community the opportunity to dig in um, and, and just um, really understand what is behind your reasoning as you come to the votes and decisions you make. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening for public comment is Deborah Prindle. Hi, everyone. So I'm Deb Prindle. Um, I have the pleasure of representing Pierce Elementary for tonight. I'm going to highlight just a few of the great things that are happening at Pierce this school year. And we're going to start with an individual accolade. Our school counselor, Angela Geisler, was selected as a recipient of the Counselor of the Year Award from Oakland Counseling Association. It's very exciting. Um, and our first point of community pride is an example of the hard work to show commitment to honoring the diversity of our community. Um, the Lunar New Year is celebrated annually at Pierce with a parade. And the English learners who have connections to the New Year and Mrs. Papagahanian, who is our um, ELL teacher, along with the Cultural Club and fifth grade with Mrs. Blastic, work together to plan this big event. And this event helps teach all the kids about Lunar New Year and promotes awareness and inclusivity. And the kids who are from countries that celebrate Lunar New Year are really proud to be part of this event. It's super exciting, big dragon comes through, the kids get delighted about it. Um, and then as a school, in February, we conducted our first school-wide STEAM night. Um, we had many different activities that were coordinated and brought to Pierce from the prestigious Michigan Science Center, the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, the Birmingham Robotics Team, the Oakland School of Steam Robotics Materials were there, um, the local business, the Robot Garage came, and students were invited to visit different areas and interact with all the activities and the materials. And then in conjunction with that, um, those activities, we also hosted our first ever third through fifth grade science fair. We had 40 students participate in this inaugural science fair, and we're hoping that it will be either annual or biannual event. And then keeping with our STEAM theme, our school-wide STEAM committee also helped us integrate and infuse some activities into our school day. Um, and one of those activities was balloons over Broadway, and it was kindergarten through fifth grade. Even our JK kids got involved. And they designed um, so students could learn more about the origins of the Macy's Day Parade and then the engineering design process. Students were provided with a balloon and were asked to develop a drawing or a physical model to illustrate how the shape of an object helps its function and is needed to solve the problem, the problem being we need our own Pierce Parade and floats that would stay in the air. Um, so the students challenged themselves to create their own balloon floats and they were very successful and then we had a gallery walk for everybody to see. It was very fun. Um, I just want to say the Birmingham vision statement says all students in Birmingham will realize their full potential, think critically, and champion an innovative tomorrow. And we really think at Pierce we're working hard with activities like these things to help that vision come to life. So, and thank you very much. Thank you. consider the consent agenda acceptance of the consent agenda. Support. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Thank you, Patty Jean Jr. Thank you. Um, now we will move into our teacher. 
teaching and learning reports. Turn over to Ms. Ontario. In the curriculum department, we can be a little, have a little much up, up here for you, but I just want to take a moment um, before I introduce the resolution um, to just take a, a step back uh, a few years. So this is my third year in the district. Um, and uh, as you know, Dr. Roberson was in my role prior to becoming our superintendent. Um, and when she was in my role, she began the process of transforming our curriculum review and course additions process. Um, and part of, of that work was really living into some core tenets when it comes to the way that we develop curriculum. Uh, we want to make sure that our process is fair and transparent. We want to make sure that our process is educator-led, that we honor the expertise of our educators. Uh, we really want to make sure that our courses and our instructional materials are going through a rigorous evaluation and that we have stakeholder involvement throughout the process. In addition to that, we want to ensure that we plan for implementation of new courses and new curriculum, and we, that is very intentional so that we can track the progress and the outcomes for our students when it comes to their academic performance in either the course or when we adopt new curriculum materials. So uh, what I'm gonna be speaking to tonight prior to introducing the resolution is the phases of our process. I'm just going to walk us through that because I know, you know for our families watching at home, for our families in the audience and also for the board, I, I just wanna make sure that we're clear about the process that we follow and, um, uh, and then I'll introduce the courses that our educators have worked so hard to create. Um, so we have a four-phase process, um, and tonight I'm going to be just digging into the four phases of a new course development. Um, so you'll notice that in phase one, for a variety of reasons, a teacher or a group of teachers may decide we need to bring a new course forward. So an example from the courses you're going to be looking at tonight is the College Board offered a new AP pre-calculus course. And so we, uh, our teachers got together and they felt as though the course might be of interest to students. Um, and there are many other reasons, academic performance, we track enrollment, uh, students make requests. There's just a, a wide range of reasons why we might bring a course forward. Um, it doesn't always mean it's a new course. It's sometimes replacing a course or, uh, or we're updating a course and we're bringing that to you for, for approval. Um, in order to name I want a course, uh, the teachers have to go to the principal, they have to go to their school cabinet, they have to come to the student learning and inclusion team. That is step one in the process. And from that they get, uh, they get the approval to, uh, to set up what we call a leadership team. Leadership team size depends uh, for a course in high school. It could be a small leadership team because we have a small number of teachers teaching that course. Uh, for our big curriculum reviews, we have over 50, 60 educators um, that might be in our leadership teams or curriculum design team. Um, so that team uh, actually works on gathering data. So as you saw at the study session, uh, our teachers used a variety of ways to gather stakeholder feedback data. They used uh, student surveys, uh, they talked to other teachers, they looked at interest, um, they also gather uh, data to make sure that the course they're proposing is standards aligned, that there's a research base to support it. Um, they develop a vision for the course, a framework, and, and an evaluation tool. In some instances, uh, an evaluation tool is not necessarily used, for example, when we're doing College Board courses, because we build off of the units of study from College Board, and that is a nationally recognized organization known for excellence in instruction, developing instructional resources. So after the leadership team does those things in step two of phase one, uh, they draft a course outline, and that course outline um, is, is robust enough that we have information that they've gathered, 
uh, but not yet the developed instructional resources that they intend to use in the course. Um, so that includes a course description, the academic goals for the course, a year at a glance, uh, any teacher certification requirements or FTE requirements, prerequisite course, and then they get feedback from the counseling and department heads to make sure everything is, is, is aligned with um, state requirements, especially for NCAA. So after they have developed that um, proposal, they go through what is called an approval process. So that approval pro process is getting approval to move to phase two. So this year, uh, uh, 13 courses came to this approval process uh, to move to phase two. So uh, the, the leadership team, or sometimes it's a couple members of the leadership team, uh, present proposals and they begin with their school cabinet um, and their principal and they present their proposals and they get approval from their school cabinet and their principal to move forward to the next committee. The next committee is the Instructional Leadership Council. So those are the district leaders that are curriculum experts. So that, that would be myself, Dr. Roberson, Dr. Lindenberg, um, and a, a few other of our, uh, Ms. Muller, um, sit on the Instructional Council, some of our curriculum coordinators, depending on the content area that we're looking at. Um, so our district curriculum experts then review and look at the course. Um, we really look at um, uh, alignment to standards in the, sorry, that's in the next phase. We look at the course, we look at the design of the course, and we approve uh, the course. We approve the course to move to the district curriculum council. So uh, when uh, the district cu curriculum council received courses, so we received 13 proposals, eight courses moved forward to the district curriculum council. Um, and uh, those eight courses were approved to move forward to phase two. So I wanna be clear what the district curriculum council is. The district curriculum council is a collection of stakeholders. And so the district curriculum council includes uh, teachers, administrators, community members, parents, students, um, all stakeholder uh, all stakeholder groups are there. Well, uh, also two school board members, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Robeson. Yes, it includes two board members. At that time, the proposals by the teachers and the teams that, are, that have authored that proposal are presented. Um, and our district curriculum council is given the opportunity to ask questions and to share feedback. Um, and then uh, the, they, we engage in dialogue, we ask questions, we get feedback, and ultimately they approve the course moving to phase two. Um, if they, uh, it's a majority rules vote, and if they vote no, uh, they are given an opportunity to let the authors of the course know, this is why I voted no. And that feedback is critical because it allows us to make adjustments uh, should it be appropriate um, to the courses based on that large stakeholder group. So after the District Curriculum Council approves uh, the courses moving to phase two, that's when the real fun begins. So that is when uh, the teachers come back together and we have uh, primary authors. The leadership team's still involved, but usually it's a couple of primary authors. One thing that we have done to uh, improve collaboration, to make sure that we're innovative, to ensure that we are educator-led, um, and uh, there's transparency across both high schools is course development for high schools includes authors from both high schools, even if the course is only going to be offered at one high school for enrollment purposes. Um, and that allows us to make sure that we are, are working collaborative, collaboratively across the district. So after it has been approved and it moves to phase two, that's when they actually develop uh, what we call the curriculum guide. The curriculum guide um, outlines the units, the lessons, it identifies the core text, the handouts that they might be using with the students, um, and it identifies the common assessments that they'll be using as a part of the course. If there are texts that are not on the already approved board list, um, they are required to have two readers review the text, um, and they have to identify any sensitive or controversial um, 
content in that text. Um, and then when they provide the curriculum uh, to us, they typically share with us how they intend to manage that content in their classroom. Um, and so I will name uh, that a requirement is that our courses expose st students to diverse viewpoints, um, and they need to ensure that they are providing a balanced perspective. So while um, one may not like one particular resource, we should look through these course guides to see for the resources that are balancing those perspectives because uh, our teachers have that as, as uh, outline in getting their course approved. Um, our next step is community engagement. And this is where there is uh, uh, an incredible amount of transparency. Um, I'm not aware of another district that puts their full curriculum guide out for community feedback. Um, so that curriculum guide is developed, um, and then once curated, the curriculum guide that does have the text in it is put out for public feedback. And we put that out both in uh, physical form, where someone can come into the office and pick up a book or a text or a curriculum guide and look at it. And we also put it out virtually, so people can do it from the comfort of their own home. And they're provided a survey where they are able to give us feedback and input on that course. Actually, the three courses that you're gonna be voting on tonight, the curriculum guide is still up on our website. We did not take the curriculum guide down, even after public, um, even after public feedback was, was closed. Um, one piece of feedback we've received uh, is uh, our community wants more time to review materials, um, and so we have granted that time, and Dr. Roberson and I have agreed upon moving forward no less than an entire week um, with previous notification for curriculum uh, reviews in the district. So uh, we have heard that feedback and, and have already responded to it by extending the time for these courses, and now uh, we have a parameter set for ourselves. Um, that uh, feedback is then shared with the course authors. Um, they review that feedback to improve their course content. Um, and for transparency, uh, I share that feedback in its raw form with both the Instructional Council and the District Curriculum Council. And so I don't modify it in any way. I download the report from the platform um, and it, it is shared uh, in that way with our course authors and our leadership team as well as the council. Um, so once uh, they get that feedback, um, they go on and they update their course based on, on what they feel is appropriate. They move into a second approval process. And so again, this is sequential, right? And so uh, they begin with the Instructional Leadership Council. Uh, that is our district curriculum experts. Um, of the eight courses we were considering this year, one course decided to wait till next year, and that's pre-AP uh, bio. Um, and then seven courses came to, instruct, to the Instructional Council. We moved three, four, three courses forward uh, to the District Curriculum Council. Um, the other courses received feedback from us, um, and they have gone back to, to, to continue working on their course to ensure it aligns to our policies to the standards and to the expectations of the district. Um, once we approve the course, uh, the Instructional Leadership Council, once the Instructional Leadership Council approves the course, it then moves to the District Curriculum Council. Again, myself, my team, the authors of the courses uh, stand in front of the Curriculum Council. They present their curriculum in its full curriculum guide. Uh, they are asked and answered, ask and answer questions. We engage in dialogue as a group, so we mix the groups up, so uh, board members and teachers and uh, students and community members are in groups together talking about how they're responding to the course. And then at the end of that meeting, the District Curriculum Council votes. They do vote in a platform. Um, they are given the opportunity to say yes or no. This course should move forward to the Board of Education. If someone should vote no, uh, that uh, they are given the opportunity to again name why, um, just so that we are aware, it might bring something to our attention that, that was missed. Um, and in this particular instance, all three of our courses received unanimous yes votes to move forward to the school board. Um, then, uh, prior to 
our study session, we post, so even though it's posted on our website, we post on board docs the complete curriculum guides. Um, and so uh, it is available prior to the study session and I, it is even still up for tonight's board meeting. So after the board approves a course, um, this is when we move into step three, which is curriculum refinement and professional development. So uh, the teachers will continue to work on the course and prepare to teach the course uh, throughout the summer. Most of the courses will begin next year. Um, and then teachers that maybe were not a part of authoring the course, um, they uh, receive professional development as well as those that author the course. So AP Summer Institutes, professional learning with our own educators who wrote the course a variety of different ways. Um, and they uh, use the curriculum guides to, to plan their daily instruction. And then our last phase, phase four, is implementing the new course and curriculum, um, ongoing professional development and support, and then we analyze the assessments um, and we apply a variety of problem solving methods um, in order to, to respond to data as the data is coming out. Our teachers are, are excellent at looking at their unit assessments and really making decisions around how, how are the students doing with standards mastery and how do I need to adjust uh, moving into the next into the next core, into the next unit. Um, and then Dr. Roberson reports out our strategic plan metrics, which obviously all courses that we teach are in some way contributing to our academic performance or our culture of unity and well-being. Um, so I just wanted to be very clear for everybody um, what the new process is. This process started uh, with Dr. Roberson and then has continued to evolve. Um, to uh, we've continued to improve upon it to make sure that it is living into those tenets of being educator-led, fair, transparent, uh, make sure we have implementation integrity. Um, and so with that said, I do have a resolution to bring for you tonight. That resolution is for three courses. I think I have it. Um, I should be able, should have it memorized by this point. Um, I have a resolution to bring forward, and I cannot find my copy of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll name to you that we are bringing forward three courses. Uh, we are bringing forward AP Seminar, uh, which is actually uh, not a, uh, it's a new part of the course, um, but it is connected to Grove's XL 10. Yay, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy, I appreciate it. Uh, we are also bringing forward AP Pre-Calculus, um, and we are also bringing forward philosophy of literature for your approval tonight. And we do have some teachers in the audience that worked on these courses with us. So I just wanna name that the, the, the process I just outlined is quite rigorous. Um, and I think could be a model for many districts. And the work that our educators have to do in order to develop these courses and get these courses approved um, is quite a lift, and I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the courses that I'm putting before you tonight, um, and I, I, I believe that they do live into our board policy. Uh, Ms. Imperial, I have to tell you that was an amazing presentation. Um, as an educator, I've been on the curriculum development for years and years, and we have never even come close to achieving such a process as you have developed here and now. Thank you. I do not understand. I do not know if the community and parents understand the work that goes behind this kind of a process and, and developing these these courses and and trying to get to the point where it's adopted as curriculum. It is so rigorous and it requires time above and beyond a teaching day, and that is something that I, I know people don't understand. As you mentioned. You know, these courses are, uh, they come to us from many different reasons and ways and so forth. Um, I, I just see that it's so thorough and it's so transparent and allows for all stakeholder groups to provide feedback and be heard. And this is quite an achievement. I kudos, shout out to all of the teachers and the work that you've done to get us here to this day. I feel so proud and I am just um, 
Yeah, I'm proud that it's come to this, and I think you're right. It could be a, um, a, a process that other districts, they themselves adopt because their processes aren't even close to what you have created, and I know that. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Questions for resolution 68 that was on the floor for acceptance of new court slates. I move to consider resolution 68 for the new curriculum courses, the three new curriculum courses. Support. Um, I do have a, I, I wanted, I just have a few things to say. I wanted to thank Trustee Zama and Sinclair for serving on the District Curriculum Council. Trustee Zama unfortunately can't be here tonight, but she did send me something that she wanted me to read in support of our three courses. Um, I just wanted to convey that I would be voting yes on these three courses. Um, AP Pre-Calc replaces the Honors Pre-Calc we already offer, so it gives students the added advantage of placing another AP course on their college application. <coughs> students have said college admission officers have told them directly that they regard applications with more AP classes as more desirable because AP courses are widely recognized as rigorous classes. Also, the event, in the event a student is taking pre-calc as their final math class in high school and not advancing to calculus, they now have the opportunity to take the AP exam and earn credit at some colleges. AP seminar is being described as a gateway AP class, and what a great way to describe it. If a student is uncertain about taking an AP class simply because they don't want to take the exam at the end to earn credit, this class gives them an opportunity to earn credit through a series of four evaluations. By taking their first AP class as a sophomore, they might be encouraged to take more AP courses throughout high school, which gives them an edge on their college applications and potentially earns them college credits. And we don't have any indication that AP seminar will put kids pull kids away from APUSH, another widely accepted AP class. Philosophy and literature adds another choice to our sing senior English electives. And the course creators have worked hard to build an interesting class that introduces students to different schools of philosophy. <coughs> Valeria has noticed over the years that many students were interested <coughs> in taking an English elective that offered challenging texts even if they weren't taking AP Lit or AP Language. Um, if I could be at the meeting, I would be voting yes to approve these three courses and I encourage the rest of the board to vote yes as well. So that was just from, and I wanted to thank again Trustee Zamet um, and then thank you to our educators who presented during our study sessions and are here tonight for any questions that we may have. I appreciate you taking time um, out of your evening to be here again this evening, so thank you. So, thank you. Trustee Baker. Thank you. Um, just because it was covered in the study session, again, um, <laughs> and there was a very <coughs> amazing presentation from all the teachers somebody like uh, Trustee Zamet said who doesn't want, who's not going to go to AP Calculus and still take it. And even if somebody doesn't choose to go the AP route in their senior year, uh, that still looks uh, much more favorable on the transcripts of having that. Um, and it's already replacing another course. And as far as the philosophy, it is Sir. Um, and the AP seminar, again, it's another AP course. So uh, the more we offer, the more competitive we are, the more uh, we hopefully climb up, which is what we're aiming for. So yes, I'm also in favor of approving these three courses. Questions, any other discussion? 
seeing none, and we have a motion made by Lori and seconded by Nicole. All those in favor of passing resolution 68, your acceptance of your proposal, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Tony Tito to the podium or there if you would like to sit there for business services. <laughs> He'll be covering resolution 6970 and 71. All right. So resolution 69 in front of the board is for the, a recommendation to approve the International Academy OCMA budget. So this is something that the board has to approve annually a lot to um, continue our involvement with the International Academy, allow our students to go. Um, as you may be aware, we have about 140 students, I believe, that attend the International Academy. Um, and their current budget or projected budget this year does not, or does uh, anticipate an increase to their fund balance, um, but no other significant changes. And this was presented to the Finance Committee uh, prior to this meeting, um, and we had a little bit more detailed conversation, but this is a summary of what was discussed at that meeting. Finance committee members, do you have anything to add or? Um, I will just say that, uh, you know, my recommendation is we approve this budget. Well, obviously we have to, to stay in the consortium, but more importantly, um, first of all, uh, in the past, this budget hasn't looked as good as it looks now. So they look like they're going to be adding to their fund balance and they um, are using an equity of effort method to make sure that uh, those districts that can't afford to pay more do. And I think that is better for the overall health of the IA. So. The approval of the International Academy OCMA campus fiscal year 2025 operating budget. Support. Made by Luke, supported by Lori. Any other discussion this week? No, I think we need. No, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Associate Dr. Mark Frederick. Uh, I also appreciate it. Um, this was a good budget presented. Resolution 70, DCS Playground Equipment. Okay, the resolution in front of the board is a recommend, recommendation to approve the purchase of playground equipment at BCS. As the board is aware, we're doing a lot of significant construction work at BCS over the summer. And um, Jason Hill, the assistant principal over at BCS, gave the Bond Oversight Committee a presentation on replacing that playground equipment um, and discussing a little bit of the funding for it. So the BCS PTA and community has raised about $50,000 or so towards the purchase of a playground. Um, it is in need of dire repair and the Bond Oversight Committee has um, uh, recommended and approved about $100,000 of bond funds to be spent. So it will be a braided funding collaboration between the BCS PTA and this bond um, to purchase this much needed playground equipment. And, you know, and I just wanna say as part of the bond committee, the presentation was fantastic. We had detailed photographs, we had you know, the reasoning behind it, um, but the bond money was already earmarked for, for BCS. So this is not any money that comes out of our, our um, 
fund equity. This is strictly for bricks and mortar, for you know what bond money is usually used for. So I just wanted to make that really clear, and I fully support um, moving resolution 70, the Bluefield Playground equipment forward. And I thank you for all of the work. Jason Hill did a great presentation, and thank you, um, Scott, for your help, and Kevin. Trustee, can I have a second? Just one. Any other discussion? I just also want to thank the PTA at BCS. They yes, did amazing what that. they uh, raised for the new playground equipment. So thank you, and yeah, um, kudos that. to them. All those in favor of move, moving and approving Resolution 70, BCS Playground Equipment, please raise your hand for that. Um, Aye. Resolution 71, the rebid landscaping and seating wall expansions. Bond money. <laughs> yes. Um, so in front of the board is a resolution to approve the recommendation. You should have received, as part of your board packet, the letter from Barton Mallow and Plant Moran Real Point outlining our bid process and recommendation um, as we had to rebid that retaining wall and landscaping over at the Sea Home Athletic Fields. Um, and the process has been long to get to this point, but we are happy to be moving forward. I'm just looking for the resolution 71, the rebid of Sea Home practice field walls and bridge. Support. Mr. Chair, excuse me, may I ask a question? So uh, it says the work's going to begin in the summer and fingers crossed it will be done before the beginning of the new school year. Is that our I'm hope? Okay. <laughs> That's what we hear. That is our hope, yes. Okay. <laughs> and that the process no is not going to disrupt the sports that are currently, right, like currently um, um, playing those sports. Because this is in part Baseball, taking ball. up that back parking lot. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, the material is, yeah. yeah it's sitting. President and members of the board, in front of you is a resolution today to replace a variety of our computers in the district. This is funded totally through the bond. Um, there are no general funds accounted for this. Um, this was reviewed by the bond oversight committee, um, and we will be using consortium pricing to get the best value for our dollar here. And also, this purchase will um, save the general fund about twenty-five thousand dollars a year in um, some operating costs as well. So, you know, we have a wide variety of programs in our district and we need the right equipment to support them. So that's what this is <coughs> refresh would do for us. Many of these computers were originally bought in 2017 um, and in a school getting everyday use that has well exceeded their everyday life. However, we are coming in under budget on this purchase because not all of our computers need to be replaced. Some of them are doing well and maintaining. So we're gonna hold on to them. Um, when they originally planned to be replaced, we did some evaluation, decided they do not need to be. So we're gonna keep those going for a while longer. Um, so this resolution is for a total of $1,096,043.55. Um, and that's a split between some Dell and Apple computers. Again, funded totally through the bond and under budget for that process. I move to consider resolution 72, the computer refresh.
moving resolution 99 we are changing our um, school board calendar from um, our we had a study a special meeting closed session on may 28th and we are moving that meeting with full board approval to tuesday may 14th special meeting um, at 6 p.m so i can just have a motion to change our special meeting date from may 28th to may 14th any comments for that i move that we um, mend the calendar to move our special meeting to may 14th give a shout out to all of our juniors and sophomores who took a barrage of tests and they're not done I'm set for tomorrow but they, they took last week this week and then I know mine came home just like flopped on the sofa the freshmen have tested today the freshmen did too mm -hmm. that's I'm good news for sure yeah. and tomorrow, <laughs> okay, tomorrow they have the business for the, the high school